We begin Chapter 1 of Advanced Accounting talking about investments in stock of other companies um, under and when we would use the equity method. In Learning Objective 1, we're going to describe the various methods of accounting for an investment in equity shares, common stock, of another company. So, GAAP recognizes four methods to report investments. Fair value, which you learned already back in intermediate accounting. The cost method, again, you learned that in intermediate accounting. Consolidation of financial statements and the equity method. Now, the consolidation of financial statements we'll be looking at starting in chapters two. This chapter, we focus on the equity method. Which method you select depends on the degree of influence the investor, the owner, has over the investee, the other company. You okay? So when do we use the fair value method? Well, this is when you're the investor, the one purchased the company, only owns a small percentage of the voting rights of the other company. So we usually look at less than 20% as the magical number, and they can't significantly affect the operations of the company they own. Um, the investment is made in usually in anticipation of dividends or market increase appreciation. Under this method, we record the investment in the equity security, so the stock, um, at cost. And so the investment account will have the cost in it. At the end of the year, when we're doing a balance sheet, we adjust it to its fair value if we can determine it. If you can't determine it, then you use the cost method, just leave it at cost. Changes in fair values are recognized in income if it's a trading security normally, and any dividends declared on the securities are also recognized as income. So let's take a look. As of December 15th, available for sale category with fair value changes recorded in other comprehensive income will no longer be available. So. Generally, when you had a trading security, you recognize any change in fair value um, in income. If it was available for sale, other comprehensive income. Now you'll just show it as income. GAAP allows for two fair value assessments that may affect cost method amounts reported on the financial statements. So if you can't determine the fair market value, if there is a, an impairment, meaning that the fair value of the investment is considerably less than the original cost, you would need to write it down. If there's an observable price change in identical or similar investments of the same issuer, again, you would write it down. Even though there's not an official fair market value out there, it's not determinable, you would use those circumstances to report it at a lower amount than the cost. So the fair value method says report it at fair value. If you don't know fair value, you use the cost. But if the value of it, just by um, the happenings in the industry, shows that it's going down in value, you must report it at the lower amount. So that's how we um, account for equity investments that we don't exercise a lot of influence over the operations of the company we own, and we usually own about less than 20%. That's the magical number. But then we have the other extreme. You own more than 50% of the voting stock of the company that you purchased. When you have this, that's when we're going into chapter two. When a majority of voting stock is held, the investor-investee relationship is so closely connected that they will be viewed as a single entity and one set of financial statements are prepared by the investor or the parent. And all of the other companies, its subsidiaries that they own more than 50% of. And they report as one entity. And we'll be talking more about that. We just want to bring it to your attention right now. 
Um, the FASB ASC Section A10 talks about variable interest entities. We'll be talking about those in Chapter 6. So these are entities controlled through special contractual arrangements, maybe not necessarily voting stocks. They're intended to combat the misuse of special purpose entities to stop corporations from keeping large amounts of assets and liabilities off the balance sheet. And that's what Enron did. Now, the equity method, and that's what we're focusing on in this chapter. We use it when the investor has the ability to exercise significant influence on the operations of the company they own, or they own between 20 and 50% of the other company. That's the magical number we look at, but we also look at the subjective item criteria that if you can exercise significant influence on the operations of the company, we have to account for it or you the investor have to account for it under the equity method even if you own a percentage less than 20 percent so what kind of um, things are looked at to determine if you can exercise this influence and I'm going to probably quote the wrong page because I'm looking at a different edition um, in front of me I don't have my ebook up but we are talking about about, I want to direct it right here. I'm on like page three and five of my book, but things like um, the investor is on the board of directors of the investee. Okay, even if you own 15%, you're a board member or somebody's a board member. The investor participates in the policy making process of the company they own. They have material intercompany transactions. They use the same management personnel. They have technological dependencies. Okay, so these are a few things that we would look at to determine, even though you don't own that magical percentage, do you exercise influence? Or even if you own that magical percentage, you may not exercise influence. You may give up your, your voting rights. Um, and that's discussed on my page six, um, but you could look through your, your um, that section under learning objective two, criteria for utilizing the equity method. So under the equity method, once we determine, do we use it? Now, how do we do the accounting under this method? The investor's share of investee dividends declared are actually decreasing the investment account, the asset investment account, not income. Now under the fair value method, that very first method, any dividend income is considered, or dividends received by the investor is dividend income. Any income from the company, net income or net loss of the company they own is ignored. Not so under the equity method. This slide is just saying that international accounting standards are almost a mirror image of what we do in the United States. So let's go into that learning objective too. These criteria and how we do the accounting. There we go. When do you use the equity method? You have that magical percentage or you have those representatives on the investees board of directors. Investor, you participate in their policy making. So you're really influencing how that company operates and you could see the rest there. Regardless of the degree of ownership, the equity method is not appropriate if investments demonstrate an agreement exists between investor and investee by which the investor surrenders significant rights as a shareholder. That's what I was talking about there. You may own 40% of the stock, but you said, I'm not going to vote. A concentration of ownership operates the investee without regard for the views of the investor. The investor attempts but fails to obtain representation on the investee's board of directors. So these are showing some circumstances that you may have the magical number in ownership, but because you don't have these types of rights, you don't influence their um, operations significantly. So you shouldn't use the equity method. We're not going to focus on them. What would you use then? Either the fair value or the cost method.
Um, this is just what we were just talking about again, just in another slide. So we are going to now be looking at the accounting for the equity method. This is a nice summary of all the stuff we just talked about. What method you use depends on either your level of ownership or your ability to influence the operations of the other company. Now, how do we do the accounting under the equity method? Well, of course, when you purchase the investment, you will debit an investment asset account and credit cash normally. But what happens after that? Well, the investor increases their investment account as the investee, the company they own, earns and reports their income. So the investor uses the accrual method to record investment income, recognizing it in the same time period as the investee earns it. So we actually increase our investment account and show that amount as income, so we'll be crediting an income or a revenue account, for the percentage of net income the company that we own makes. Okay, so as soon as they make the profit, we show it as income, the investor shows it as income, and increases their investment account. They would do the opposite if it's shown um, if there's a loss. When the investor um, receives or, or when a cash dividend is declared by the investee, the investor on that day will decrease their investment account immediately. Okay, so if you think about this and if you draw a T account, I love T accounts, and write the word investment. When the investor purchases the investment, they will debit that account. So I'm writing purchases on the debit side, purchased. When the investee reports net income, the investor will debit the investment account for their share of it. When the investee declares a dividend, the investor will credit their investment account for dividends. So they're increasing their investment account when the investee's equity is increasing and they're decreasing the investment account when the investee's equity is decreasing. And that's really what's happening here. Because of the amount of influence, that investment account should be mirroring the equity area of the investee. Let's look at an example. Big company owns 20% interest in Little Company. They purchased it on January 1 for 200000 Little reports net income of 250, dollars 300 and 400 respectfully in the th next three years, and they declare dividends of 50, 100, and 20. Fair values of big investment in Little as determined by market prices were 245, 282, and 325. Now this is also in your book, but just to show you a comparison of the two methods. When the um, company, big company, does not have significant influence, they're going to use the fair value method of accounting. What kind of income will they be showing? They'll be showing dividends as income their proportionate share, 20%. So 20% of the 50,000 will end up being income, 20% of the 100,000 and 20% of the 200,000. They'll also show an income, the increase for that year in fair value from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So there's the increase in fair value each year. I'm not remembering all of the um, fair values off the top of my head. Oh, yep. It's going from 200 to 245. So 45,000 additional income for that increase from cost to fair value at the end of the year. 
from the end of the first year to the end of the second year, it goes up to 282,000. So an additional 37,000 will be shown as income in the second year. From the third year, second year to the third year, it goes from 282 to 325,000. So in 2019, 43,000 due to that increase in value. So overall, they're going to show 70,000 in income for the dividends for those three years and 125,000 because of the increase in value from the day they bought it through the end of the third year. Under the equity method, how will, what will they show in income? Well, they'll show 20% of the $250,000 or 50,000. 20% of the 300,000 of net income of little company or 60,000. 400,000 times 20% or $80,000. Over those three years, they just show net income at 20% of little company as income on their big company will show it on their income statement 190. Well, how does this affect their investment account? Ah. Well, they start with a $200,000 investment and draw a T account. To follow along with what I'm saying. So in your T account, you're going to have investment at the top, a debit of $200,000 to um, record the purchase. Now, during the first year, they're going to increase their investment account by their proportionate share of net income, $50,000, and decrease it by their proportionate share of dividends, 10000 We already figured that out. So at the end of the first year, the value of the investment will be $240,000. you will do the same thing for the second year. Add the $60,000 of net income, but decrease it for the $20,000 in dividends. That will give the end of year $280,000. And you would do the same thing for the third year. So we're going to be showing you these journal entries in a few seconds. OK, and this is what I was just talking about, but looking at the actual table. Now, how do we do the journal entries? We, we've seen the effect on the investment account. How do we do the journal entries? Well, here's Big Company. Big Company records the following journal entries to apply the equity method for its investment. Now, remember what I said. The first thing they have to do is purchase the investment. So the day they purchase the investment, they're going to debit an asset called Investment in Little Company, $200,000. Then... Sorry about that. I'm not going to take that. Then they are going to, at the end of 2017, increase the investment in Little Company 50000 and for the net income of Little Company and then increase a revenue account that will be on their income statement called Equity Investee Income, $50,000. Where do we get that? In a Little Company at $250,000 of net income in 2017 times 20%. Now the day Little Company declares their dividend Big company's proportionate share, 20% of the 50000 that was declared, will be debited to dividend receivable, an asset, 10000 and immediately decrease that investment in little company, $10,000. So we increase the investment account for the investor's proportionate share of investee income and decrease it for dividends. And then, of course, when the dividends are paid, Big company receives it, debit cash, credit the dividend receivable. So that's our starting point for journal entries. And that's really the, the meat and potatoes of the equity method. Notice nothing about fair value here. Nothing. OK. So what's next? What 
other kind of crazy stuff is there involved with the equity method? Because we know there has to be something, and there is. In objective four, we're going to show you how we allocate the cost of an equity method investment, and we have to compute special amortization expense to match revenues recognized from the investment to the excess the investor's cost is over the investee's book value. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but it will in a minute. There's, remember when we are doing accounting, we are doing everything at cost, basically. There's some things we report at fair value, but for the most part, the balance sheet of a company is at cost or even less than cost, and we call that book value. So whenever we're discussing book value, we're basically saying the balance sheet values. And then the other side of the coin is fair value, what it's worth today. Now, fair value is based on many different factors. It's, it could be profitability of the company, new products of the company, projected operating results, or just general economic conditions can cause the value today to be higher. Okay. Assets and liability on the accounts are at historical cost rather than these current values. Furthermore, these amounts on our balance sheets are also affected by the accounting methods we choose, LIFO, FIFO, or the different depreciation methods. When a purchase price exceeds book value, we got to find out why. And there's two major reasons why. There could be specific assets and liabilities that are undervalued on the books of the company, or the investor just paid more than the actual fair value of the company. That extra payment that's paid is goodwill. We have to try to separate those out. So let's take a look at an example. Grande Company is negotiating the acquisition of 30%, 30% of the outstanding shares of Chico Company. Chico's balance sheet reports assets of 500,000. Now remember, that's book value, so you could jot this down. 500,000 minus 300,000 in liability. So the net assets, book value, 200,000 in total for 100% of the stock. Grandy determines that Chico's equipment, aha, is undervalued. So the fair value is actually $60,000 more. And one of its patents is also lower on the balance sheet by $40,000. So if we add those to the current book value of Chico, the fair value of the company is really $300,000. Think about that. Make sure you follow that through. It starts at 200000 Two of the assets are undervalued in the book value by 100000 in total. So the fair value, if we add that 100000 is really 300000 So you would expect Grande to pay, if they're buying 30%, $90,000. And if that's the case, then they are purely buying um, the assets at their fair value. Okay, and we can attribute that $90,000 and that difference between the book value at 30%, which is 200,000 times 30% or 60, and the 90 is from the difference in the asset value. So here's what it looks like. Payment by investor, 90,000. What's their percentage of book value they're buying? 60. But two assets are undervalued. The first one's undervalued by 60000 So if we add 30% of that, okay, and then the patent is also undervalued by 40000 30%, so 12000 that makes up that $30,000 difference. So they're truly buying the fair value of the net assets. They're not paying more than the fair value of the net assets. Okay. 
Next, what happens? Well, when you can attribute the um, extra payment to particular assets, and those assets have definite lives, definite remaining lives, we take the, the amount that we just paid for that part of the fair value of the asset. So the equipment was 18,000, the patent was 12, if you look back to that prior slide, and we're going to expense or amortize that over those useful lives. So over the next 10 years, we have to amortize that $18,000 or $1,800 a year, and for the patent, $2,400. Anything related to goodwill, which it wasn't in that last example, so I'm sorry you see that there, but if we did have goodwill, it's indefinite life. You don't expense it. So the $4,200 is how much we need to expense because of the difference in asset values, limited life assets. Goodwill is associated with equity method in investments for the most part, and it's measured in the same manner as we would from any other business purchase. We also test for decline in value and impairment, just so we are aware of that. So we just don't say, oh, we're never going to expense goodwill. If there's any kind of impairment associated with goodwill, we will write it down. We're just not going to go through the process right now. So how do we record that $4,200? Well, we actually debit that equity in, in investee income. Remember when we were reporting um, the net income associated with the investee? We use that equity and investee income account. Well, we're going to decrease it by debiting it, and then we'll decrease the investment account also. There are some additional issues with regards to the equity method. We're going to look at them now for a few minutes and just bring them to your attention. Um, this is a change that's just taken place over the last year or two, and it's what happens if you only owned 10% um, of a company, exercised no significant influence one year. The next year, you buy more stock in that company, and now you own 35% and can use the equity method. Well, in, in matter of fact, in edition six of your book, it was a whole process you had to go through. And it's what we call retrospective. We had to treat the investment like it's always been an equity investment. What a disaster, very complicated. They changed it to say, just um, start accounting for your investment now in the equity method going forward. So you just purchase the additional stock, increase your investment account, and then start using the equity method. So it's pretty straightforward, just like we were doing. Reporting investee income from sources other than continuing operations. Okay, so we must show all the net income, our proportionate share of all the net income from an investee. So we don't stop at continuing operations on an income statement. We go right down to net income. So if there's discontinued operations, the investor must um, record their proportionate share under the equity method. Also, if there's other comprehensive income on the investee's books, so it's accounted for in their um, other comprehensive income statement, and in their equity section, guess what? We do too. Now, we would account for it, and when I say we, the investor would account for it in their other comprehensive income, but they would have to report a proportionate share of it. Remember, we're trying to mirror the investee's equity section once we go into the equity method. Reporting investee losses, so if we have a permanent reduction in the value of a company, that is an impairment, and we must write it down, the, um, write our investment down. We will never write the investment account 
past zero. So all losses are recorded until the investment account reaches zero and then we abandoned the equity method. The next section deals with um, the sale of an equity investment. I'm sorry, here is uh, what we're talking about, reporting a change to the equity method. I thought it just went to a different type of slide, so I apologize for that. So I'm kind of kind of reveal what I was just talking about, but you'll see it all in, in black and white in front of you as well. So if we report or if we have an investment that wasn't in the equity method, we were using the fair value method, once we purchase more stock and it now qualifies for the equity method, the prospective approach avoids complexity of restating stuff from prior periods. We just start accounting for it going forward. So if Alpha Company acquires a 10% ownership in Bailey on January 1 for 84000 10%, no significant influence. They'll report it under the fair value method as a trading security or available for sale. Report dividend income as um, revenue. Report uh, increase or decrease in fair value as a income or loss on the income statement. And that's what I was just saying. <laughs> But then on January 1, 2018, the next year, additional 30% of Bailey's outstanding voting stock is purchased for 267. Well, we're just going to add that 267,000 to the company's investment account. Um, we also found out in blurb two that the reason for it. Um, uh, the fair value was above the carrying amount or book value of the assets was because of a patent that was undervalued of 175000 that still has a remaining useful life. And you have to remember, we now own 40% of Bailey. Alpha uh, owns 40%. So there is the additional amount going into investment in Bailey Company. Um, the current fair value of the initial 10% investment is 89000 at the end of the year plus the 267 that they paid. It's at $356,000. 40% of the book value of Bailey's net assets are 286. That means they paid $70,000 more than the book value. Well, the one of the reasons the book value and fair value or the only reason is different is from a hundred seventy five thousand dollar undervalued uh, patent well forty percent of a hundred seventy five thousand makes up for that seventy thousand dollar difference if there was excess say um we paid ninety thousand dollars and we could only account for that seventy thousand dollar difference there then the difference would be goodwill that would be goodwill then. So they'll debit the investment in Bailey Company at the end of the year, credit the equity in investee income for 45000 That accounts for um, reporting 40% of the net income of Bailey and writing off $7,000 of that patent amortization. Remember on the last slide, there was a $70,000 difference attributed to why we paid more than the book value. We have to write that off over the life of the patent. They also are receiving, um, have a dividend declared by Bailey of 50000 in total. Alpha is receiving 20000 of it, so debit dividend receivable, credit investment in Bailey Company, the asset account. And then when they receive the dividend, debit cash, credit dividend receivable. Okay, so just do it like you always have. Other comprehensive income, remember, is defined as revenues, expenses, gains, and losses that are under GAAP. Um, they're in comprehensive income but excluded from net income. Items included in accumulated other comprehensive income on the balance sheet are usually accumulated, accumulated derivative net gains and losses, which you might have seen in intermediate accounting, foreign currency translation adjustments we'll see in this class, and certain pension adjustments.
So they're items that are not accounted for directly on the income statement, but affect equity. And they're not caused by um, owners putting investment in or taking money out. So accounting requires that the investor record its share of investee OCI um, and irregular items traditionally found in net income like discontinued operations. It's reported in stockholders' equity and represents a source of change in investee company net assets that is recognized under the equity method. So we would increase or decrease the investment account accordingly. When there's an, uh, reporting investee losses, so this is what I was saying, if there is a permanent change, we must write down the value of the investment never past zero. And that's what we're talking about there. And what happens when we sell an investment? If part of an investment is sold during the period, two things you have to do. First, you must update the investment account to the date of the transaction for any income earned by the investee and any dividends declared by the investee. And then update your book value of your investment account. And then you take that proportionate share that you sold out of the investment account. Okay, now our final area is describing the rationale on computations to defer gross profits on intra-entity inventory sales until the goods are either consumed or sold to outside parties. Yikes, let's take a look. Many equity acquisitions, so two companies, they establish ties between companies to facilitate direct purchase and sale of inventory items. So one company buys another company so that they could exchange inventory. One company sells, the other company's providing or buying it. Such intra-entity transactions can occur on a regular basis or sporadically. So there's two different types of sales and two different ways we describe them. If it's the investor selling to the investee, it's called a downstream sale. I'll be right up. Dinner's on the stove. I'm recording. If it's an upstream sale, it's going from the investee to the investor. Remember, the investor is the one who is exercising significant control. So it depends on the direction of the sale. Profit recognition is delayed on these types of sales, downstream sales, investor, sales to investee. So the investor will not recognize any profit until the buyer, the investee, sells it to an outside party. So what we're saying here is that investor sells goods to investee. Investee is then going to sell it to the customer. Investor does not show that as a sale, recognize any profit on that, until the investee actually sells it to a third party. Investor decreases current equity income to defer that profit. When the inventory is eventually consumer sold, the deferral is no longer needed and it would be taken out. The investor should recognize the deferred intra-entity gross profit then. Recognition shifts from the year of inventory transfer until the actual sale to an outside customer. So take a look. If gross profit on an original intra-entity sale is 30% of 10,000 in sales, investor profit associated with the sale is 3,000. If 40% of the investee stock is held, just 1,200 of the profit is actually deferred. Current equity income decreases by $1,200 to defer the intra-entity profit and temporarily remove 30% of the profit from the investor's books in 2018 until that investee actually sells the inventory next year. So here would be your journal entry. You would debit equity investee income, there's that account again, 
1200 and credit the investment account. Next year, you would reverse that once it's sold. Upstream sales are reported in the same manner as downstream. Profit recognition is delayed by the investee until the buyer disposes of the goods. So the investor decreases current equity income to reflect the deferred portion of that profit. The investor's own inventory account contains the deferred gross profit. Recognition of profit is deferred by decreasing the investment account rather than the inventory balance. When the inventory is eventually consumer sold, the deferral is reversed. So again, let's take a look. Suppose the investee sells merchandise costing $40,000 to the investor for 60, and at the end, the investor still retains 15,000 of the goods. The investee reports net income of 120,000 for the year. The investor records a journal entry to reflect that basic accrual. 120,000 times 40 percent. But then a second entry is required to defer um, of the investee at year end. The income accrual is reduced and the investor defers its portion of that intra-entity gross profit or two two thousand dollars. Just give me one second here. I'll take a look at something. And that $2,000 would be the 15,000 remaining ending inventory times 33 and a third percent, which is the gross profit percentage, or 5,000. Since the investor owns 40% of the 5,000, 2,000 would be the amount that would be deferred. Okay, so we have to be careful when there's those intra-entity transactions with inventory and make sure we do the accounting there. Financial reporting effects. Measurements of financial performance often affect the firm's ability to raise capital, managerial compensation, the ability to meet debt covenants, and managers' reputations. Criticisms of the equity method. We emphasize the 20 to 50 percent of voting stock versus control. It allows for off-balance sheet financing and it potentially biases performance ratios and you could take a read through that on the criticism side. Finally, the rationale and reporting implications of fair value accounting for equity method type of investment. So an entity may irrevocably, and that's the key, irrevocably, you can never change back. You could say, I don't want to do the equity method, even if you have significant influence, and always report a fair value, whether your investment goes up or down. So you elect fair value as the initial and subsequent measurement for certain financial assets and financial liabilities, including investments. And these are ones that are normally accounted for under the equity method under the fair value option, and that's what it's called, the fair value option. It's different than the fair value we talked about before. The fair value we talked about before was basically um, the influence and the ownership percentage. This is saying, I do significantly influence, I do have 20 to 50 percent, but I'm taking a fair value option, which is irrevocable. Changes in the fair value of the financial items are included in earnings. So increase or decrease in the equity investment um, due to fair value changes are reported directly on the income statement. It improves financial reporting because now you're reporting stuff at fair value. That's why companies like it. It provides entities with the opportunity to mitigate volatility in reported earnings. Um, without having to apply complex accounting provisions. The fair value option matches asset values with fair value reporting requirements for many liabilities. So it's just some of the um, reasons why it is used. I don't want to end it there, but um, I just wanted to 
remind you, take a look at the example at the very end of the chapter so you can see how this fair value reporting would be done for an um, company that, or a, I'm sorry, an investment that would otherwise be an equity method. You'll see you report the investment at what you pay for it. When you get a dividend, you report it as dividend income. You don't affect the investment account. When the company makes money as net income or net loss, you ignore it. And you write the um, investment up or down to fair market value. And you can never change back. Okay, so this was the beginning of our talk about investments and the starting point for us was really the equity method. What happens when you buy it? What happens during the year? What happens if you, with those special considerations and upstream and downstream sales? So take a look at the um, exercises and problems and post any questions you may have.